we will now apply whatever we have learned so far to actually control the motor. We are now getting out of the motor per se and getting into the controller, which will control the motor according to all the physics about the motor that we have learned so far. And the, the best possible uh, control, there are different methods of control that are used in different contexts. Uh, the best one that we would recommend for an electric vehicle is what is called field oriented control. And uh, before getting into the details of it, let us understand what is it, what is it that we want to control, what is in our control, what are we trying to control. This word control is used in a very ambiguous way, vague way. See all that we can do to the motor, supposing there is a motor lying on my table, all that I can do is I can apply a voltage to it. There is really nothing else under my control. If I apply a voltage, it will draw the current that it wants, it will rotate in the way it wants, all depending on its internal physics. When I say it wants, depending on its internal design, construction, physics, and everything, it will deliver the kind of torque that it is capable of delivering. There is nothing else I can do to it other than change the voltage that is being applied. So, that is the only thing, but it is an AC voltage. So, we can when I say I am applying a voltage, I can decide what is the amplitude of the voltage, what is the frequency of the voltage, what is the phase of the voltage. All of this is in my control. This is the this is all there is in my control, nothing else. But what do we want to control? We are not interested in controlling the voltage itself it is only a means. What we want to control is the speed, how fast is it going? I want it to go at 2800 rpm, that is what I want to control. And whenever we want to control something, first we should be able to measure it. We will come to why in the next slide, but anything that I want to control, I must be also able to measure it to know that it is under control, otherwise I do not know if it is under control. And speed can be measured through any number of devices, uh, very commonly we use Hall sensors, we can also use encoders, we can use something called resolvers, these are all different instruments that will tell us what is the speed. The other thing that we want to control is the torque, we want to control the speed, we want to control the torque and torque we know is related to the current. So, if I can measure the current, since I have already measured the parameters of the motor like back EMF constant and other things, I can do my arithmetic and say if this is a current, this is a torque, fine. So, I can measure the torque indirectly by measuring the current. And then when we are doing flux weakening, we want to measure the I d because we want to increase that and an indirect way of measuring that will be inferring it from the speed and the current using the voltage equations. So, if I know the basic parameters like what is the resistance, what is the L d and L q and what is the back EMF constant, if I know these things then I can infer and I can back calculate what current should be going in and for that current to go in what voltage I should apply. And then by measuring the parameters that I am interested in, I can see whether my calculation is correct or is there any deviation and normally there will be a deviation. I will apply a voltage thinking that it will make the motor run at 2800 rpm. But when I actually measure, I may find it is running at only 2650 rpm, it is 150 rpm short. Then what should I do? I should slightly increase the voltage. So, by measuring what I want to control and comparing it with my desired value, the difference between them, I will call it as error, 
and I will compensate that error by changing whatever is in my control which is the voltage. So, this is called closed loop control the commonest uh, way it is done is what I am describing again there are different approaches that different people take, but the most common way of achieving closed loop control is what I am discussing here. Um, the most generic name given to whatever the thing that we want to control I can say it is a vehicle, it is a motor, it is a chemical plant uh, where some chemicals are flowing through pipes whatever, whatever is we want to control is generically called as the plant or the process any name one can give. Now, I am giving an input let us say there is an operator for, uh, for the moment we will think that the controller is a human operator with a lot of knobs in front of him and I am telling him that I want the motor to run at 2800 rpm. So, he turns the knob and sets it to a certain level which is the voltage and says okay, this should give 2800 rpm and then what happens I have got some sensors they are giving me a feedback that the rpm is only 2650. So, when I subtract 2650 from the set value of 2800 the difference the plus and minus is the way of doing difference the next input that goes to the operator who is called the controller is 150 what it means is increase the speed by 150 more that is the error. Now, based on that information he has to increase the knob to the extent of 150. How does 150 the error translate into the input change should I turn it by 10 degrees 12 degrees or 8 degrees how much more should I turn is the decision that the controller has to make. So, there are three ways in which the controller will interpret the error one is if I say that the error is 150 then I will turn it by an angle which is proportional to 150. The other thing I will do is okay, right now the error is 150, but one second ago what was the error one more second ago what was the error if I add up all the historical errors what is it and proportional to that historical error I will add another term the controller will add another angle which is proportional to the sum of all the errors that happened in the history. And the third thing that the controller will try to analyze is okay, the error now is 150, but what is the trend of this error is this error increasing or is it decreasing the rate of change of the error and based on the rate at which the error is changing it will sort of anticipate that the future error is going to be like this let me compensate for that also now itself. So, there are three terms of error one is simply proportional to the error another is proportional to the integral of the error and another is proportional to the rate of change of the error. So, whatever we are measuring here as the error is translated into three different terms and based on some sort of a judgment the controller will assign different weightages to the three errors. The weightage it gives are called the loop gains k p is the is the weightage that is being accorded to the term which is proportional to the error k i is the weightage for the integral of all the errors and k d is the weightage given to the rate at which the error is changing and after assigning these weightages when I add up everything I will get some value 17.3. So, I will turn the knob by 17.3 degrees 
in response to the statement that the error is 150. So, what is very critical is that the weightages must be correct. How do you know what weightage is correct? If I change the weightage, this angle will change and the entire system may become unstable. From uh, 2650, the RPM will shoot up to 3000 and then I will try to decrease it, it will come back to 100 and it will go wild. That is called unstable behavior. So, give assigning the correct weights, the correct values of Kp, Ki and Kd is very important and the way it is done is by understanding how the entire system responds to the extent we understand the inner dynamics of the motor itself. The inner dynamics of any uh, mechanical system will be broadly dependent on an inertia term which is given here as j and a friction term uh, given by uh, b and I can create a rough model of how this thing is and I can have k p which is proportional to the error, the k i is proportional to the integral of the error in the Laplace transform will become 1 by s and the k d is proportional to the differential of the error in the Laplace transform it will become multiplied by s and I can create a model like this and solve it using some tool like MATLAB or something to arrive at what is the optimum value of k p, k i and k d or I can just do it by trial and error in experiments. I will do a number of experiments by using different combinations of k p, k i and k d and see which one is working. If I do it like that experimentally that is called tuning, it is called p i d tuning uh, or I could solve again solving assumes that I know the value of j, value of b and most importantly there is another term here called d which is disturbances. The disturbances will be the force coming from the wind on the blowing from the sideward direction, suddenly there is an up and down in the road all of those are disturbances. So, it is not possible to perfectly model everything, but to the extent we understand it we can model it and we can come to a k p, k i, k d combination which is optimum. And the job of the k p, k i, k d terms is because we do not understand the physical model perfectly there will be a deviation and whenever there is a deviation correct it, course correct it. So, this is the way in which we do control. So, you understand now that to be able to control anything I must measure it. If I do not measure it I cannot get a feedback therefore, I do not know if there is an error or not. So, this is as far as control is concerned. Before we implement control in software, as I said, we have to measure, and whatever we measure will normally come to us as an analog value. There will be a certain voltage coming from a wire from the sensor. But for me to manipulate it in my processor, I have to convert it into a digital value. And the device that is used is called an ADC analog to digital converter. So, it will take any analog value and give it out as a digital value of certain resolution. So, this is the first step. So, I get a voltage which is proportional to the speed from the speed sensor and the ADC will take that voltage and convert it into a digital number. The other thing that often happens is that whatever the sensor is, is measuring something, but there are a lot of other disturbances in the environment because of which it also picks up noise. So, what it gives me is the measurement which is also mixed up with a lot of noise. The characteristic feature of this noise is that the noise keeps going up and down very frequently, it is of high frequency compared to the rate at which the signal itself will change. What is measured like speed will change gradually, but the noise and the speed will keep going up and down very rapidly. So, I can remove that noise by using what is called a software filter. What is a software filter we will see in the next slide.
it will actually be an assignment for you. Uh, but you can see that the raw signal coming from the sensor is what is shown here in, as the blue lines. Every uh, instant that it is giving me, it is giving me a different value. So, the actual signal is around 1500, but the value I am getting is maybe plus or minus 100 within that range it is just fluctuating wildly and then the speed is being increased to 2000 rpm. All along the way the noise is persisting and after I reach 2000 also the noise is persisting and in fact the noise is not even dependent on the level whether I am at a lower speed or at a higher speed noise is roughly the same and when I apply a filter what I get is the brown line and that brown line is very clean and smooth and that is what I will now take for all my further processing in the controller. And finally, whatever value I get is just a number and I have to interpret it or translate it to represent the entity that I am interested in. For example, I get a voltage which has a relationship with the rpm, but the number itself is not equal to the rpm. So, I may have to do some manipulation of it to convert it into rpm. So, usually it involves a scale shifting, a level shifting and then a scaling. A combination of these two things will then give me the value that I am interested in. So, having done all of this, now I have the measured value in my memory location in the processor, which I can start using for the purposes of control. So, here is an assignment about what we just now discussed. So, I have a throttle, when I turn it, a voltage proportional to how much I am turning goes to the controller. And let us say the extent by which I am turning is a proxy for the speed at which I want to go. If I have slightly turned it, it means I want to go at 20, 20 kilometers per hour. If I am turning it more, it means I want to go at 35 kilometers per hour. If I turn it really high, it means I am trying to go at 60 kilometers per hour. So, depending on how fast I want to go, I am turning it. This message has to go to the controller it goes through a sensor which may simply be a potentiometer which is then giving a voltage proportional to how much I am turning. But because the wire is long and it is coming in contact with many things along the way it also picks up a lot of noise which is what we saw in the previous slide and then we do a software filter after converting it to a DC using the ADC we filter out the noise and we find that the filtered signal is very smooth. Uh, the normal way in which this filtering is done is that supposing I am taking a reading every millisecond, every successive instant of time is 1 millisecond apart and I have a value like let us say 1500 now. The next millisecond it has become 1580 because of the noise. Instead of taking its value to be 1580, I will take only one tenth of that value 1580 into 10 percent which is like 158 and the value I already have which is 1500, I will give it a complementary weight of 90 percent. So, 1500 into 90 percent is 1350 plus 158, what does it add up to? 1350 plus 158, 1508. So, instead of 1500 jumping up to 1580, the next value has only jumped up by 8. I have suppressed the noise component which was 80. 90 percent suppression of the noise has happened 
if I want to do it even more aggressively, I can say that I will only give 1 percent weight to the new reading and 99 percent weight to the older reading and I will keep on doing it every instant. So, all the fluctuations will get damped out. This is how the software filter is implemented and it is easy to implement in software because you are not making any extra wires and resistances or anything and you can just do it by computation. And what we like is the fact that it is smooth, but what I want you to notice is that when the signal changes from about 1700 or something it is going to 2000 and there is a transition that is happening. When the transition is happening the filtered signal is responding with a delay it should have responded like the red line because that is the true way in which the transition happened. But the filtering has a downside which is that it causes a delay why does this delay happen and what will be its effect on the vehicle behavior this is what I want you to figure out. And uh, finally, before we get into the heart of what the controller does which in some sense we have already covered in the previous lessons, uh, the additional detail I want to say is that um, no matter what happens we want the device to be safe, the passenger to be safe, the vehicle to be safe. So, we create a lot of fences around that is also there in the controller to safeguard everything. So, typically there will be four kinds of these fences, one is protecting against overcurrent. If for some reason there is a sudden surge of current in a matter of a fraction of a second that excess current will cause localized heating of some component in just a fraction of a second because these are very tiny components and that component will blow and the consequence of that blowing is that something else will happen somewhere and all sorts of things and can go berserk. We do not know what will happen. So, we want to limit, we want to protect the entire thing against any runaway increase in current even before anything can get damaged the fact that the current is going dangerously high we want to take action and protect the device. And the other thing is over voltage again if the voltage were to suddenly rise unpredictably it will actually lead to an over current situation. And then there are also devices which have a specification of voltage even if no current is uh, flowing if the voltage goes above a certain level the component will break down and then it will suddenly start conducting um, and that will then lead to an inrush of current. The other thing that we have to monitor is under voltage under voltage you may think is very safe nothing will happen nothing can get damaged, but actually in all switching devices particularly I will say that if the voltage is less than 2 volts it is off if it is more than 7 volts it is on, but if the voltage is 4 or 5 volts it is an undefined state and you can never predict what will happen very peculiarly it will start conducting or not conducting and behave in an unpredictable manner. So, under voltage can be very dangerous and it will lead to very unpredictable behavior that is another thing that we have to monitor carefully. And then of course, we will have a few temperature sensors like earlier there was discussion about temperature sensors to monitor temperature in a battery inside the motor inside the controller also we have temperature sensors if the temperature is rising uh, we have to take corrective action to protect everything. But remember that this temperature protection is not a very uh, helpful thing for other failure conditions like this, because when there is an over current the overall temperature in the place where I have kept the temperature sensor will not increase, but because high current is flowing through some track and going to some component and things like that in those localized places there will be a sharp rise in the temperature which will not be detected by the temperature sensor. So, uh, having a temperature sensor does not mean that you do not need over current protection and other things. So, that is the reason why all of these are there although the failures are finally, all thermal only certain thermal failures can be detected by the temperature sensor for other things we use uh, 
uh, we use the proxy of current or the voltage to identify failure modes. And these fences we can draw them in software and in hardware. Uh, if I do it in software it is convenient because I can configure and flexibly change things even during the course of a ride I will say temporarily I will increase this limit there etcetera etcetera I can do it is flexible. But with software there could be some bug and in some condition that boundary may fail. If that happens we still want to have a final hardware check on the whole thing which is not affected by any of the uh, software misbehaviors and things like that. So, these uh, boundaries are applied both in the software and in the hardware. <laughs> so, we have seen so far what are the things that we want to control which is speed, torque and flux in the case of flux weakening, how we can measure them and using our earlier knowledge about the parameters of the motor, we can convert our desired parameter of torque and speed and flux into some voltage to be applied. And what is the knowledge that we use to do that? First is what we already learnt about MTPA maximum torque per ampere that is implemented in a block of code called the MTPA block. There is a uh, set speed and there is a measured speed based on the difference between the two I know what is the error in speed. There is a P i controller again another point I forgot to mention I was talking about P i d, but normally we do not use d can anybody tell me why we almost never use the d we just set the k d to be 0 it is only k p and k i that we use. The answer is related to the noise problem that we saw in the signals. If the signal is moving up and down like this, then during any two successive instances, if I have a signal like this, then between here and here, actually the true signal is only like this, but because of this noise, I will think that the error is going up like this. And if this is 1 millisecond interval and I extrapolate it to 1 second. I will say next second the error is going to be so big. So, I will violently overcorrect. So, unless I have perfectly noise free environment it is very dangerous to use the d term and extrapolate from the d term. So, always we avoid using the d term we only use p and i. So, there is a p i uh, regulation let me raise this and based on the p i regulation. I know what is the current that is needed to supply the torque and then I have what is called the MTPA algorithm which tells me that if you want maximum torque for a given value of current then you divide the current into two components one is IQ and one is ID. So, based on that algorithm which is like a lookup table using that lookup table I will add an ID component so that I get maximum possible torque for the given amount of current and then send it to another block which is here written as the current regulation block. All that this block does is it converts the current into voltage whatever we saw in the voltage discussion earlier. It will use the ID and IQ and all the parameters of the motor that are known and convert that into V d and V q and apply it on the motor. Except when I want to do flux weakening, if I am if I am trying to run at a speed greater than the rated speed, then instead of directly converting it into the voltages, I will go through an extra block called the flux weakening block. When the voltages are calculated here, I told you the V d and V q are calculated in the current regulation block. If that voltage is greater than what the battery can supply, we earlier discussed in the example that that limit is 34 volts. 
if the pair of ID and IQ coming from the MTPA block results in a voltage which is greater than 34 volts, then we enter the flux weakening loop. You see that there is a condition. If the sum of the square of VD and VQ is greater than the limit, then we enter the flux weakening loop and the flux weakening loop has its own PI for the flux, another PI loop which is called the flux loop and that will add an additional component called IFW in this picture. I do not know if it is clear, I can zoom in if you want. So, there is an additional component called I flux weakening which is added to the I D. So, the I D that is coming from the MTPA block is augmented with an additional component of I D which is meant to further weaken the flux and reduce the back EMF and then that pair goes into the current regulation block. It will again recalculate the voltage to see whether it is below the desired limit. If it is then it will supply that voltage to the uh, motor and if it is not it will again keep going in this loop till it comes down and these loops are executed in uh, microseconds. Uh, so, fraction of a millisecond. So, very rapidly it will do number of iterations and bring the uh, voltage down to an appropriate level by adding sufficient ID before it is getting applied to the motor. <laughs> so, this increased I D is to reduce the voltage demand by reducing the back EMF. So, this pretty much covers what the controller as in all the control logic does. If you have any questions about this, please ask me. Yeah. 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 So the question is: the rotor has permanent magnets. How can we reduce the flux? We are not reducing the flux of the magnet itself, but we are adding a additional flux in the opposite direction so that the resultant flux is lower. The magnet continues to give the same flux that it was giving before. If I were to quickly take you through the yeah, the xi m is a fixed number. It does not change at all. I cannot change it, but the total flux on the d axis is xi m minus L d i d and L d also is a fixed number. I cannot change it. Only thing that I can change is i d. If I increase I D, L D into I D will also become more. Therefore, xi m minus L D I D, which is the resultant flux, which is actually being seen by the battery, will come down. Fine. I am only weakening the flux, but I am not weakening the magnet itself. And uh, now that you brought this up, I will also tell you another important, uh, but subtle point that I didn't mention. Uh, you can see here that when I add when I add an additional ID, the total ID will increase because it will be ID plus the additional I due to flux weakening. The sum of the two, if it becomes very large, then the negative flux will become so much that it may permanently weaken the magnet. If you recollect what we talked about negative uh, magnetomotive force, magnetic uh, intensity uh, causing the flux to deplete, where we discussed about the coercivity and all that. So, there is a certain limit beyond which if I increase the ID, it will permanently weaken the magnet, it will not recover it will become a much weaker magnet, then the future performance of the motor will be poorer, it will deliver less torque. So, we set a limit. After I add the additional flux weakening thing, I try to check whether it is exceeding the limit. That is another protection boundary that is there in the software 
and uh, if it is within it normally it will be within it then I allow it. If it is so high then I will not allow it, it means I will not reach that speed. If I am trying to reach 20,000 rpm then maybe I will exceed this speed and that will not be allowed because that means the magnet will get permanently damaged.